last time I defined co-algebras for you. Last time I defined co-algebras. And uh, let me just begin by qu quickly reminding you of the definition of a co-algebra. And then we will talk about the duality between co-algebras and algebras. So that's the topic of today, the duality between co-algebras and algebras. So just to remind you, um, when I have a coalgebra, what that means is that C is going to be a vector space together with some linear maps. The first map is the coproduct, and it goes from C to C tensor C. And the co unit which goes from C to K. And here, and here K is, is our ground field. C is a vector space over K. And you need to satisfy certain axioms. So again, just to, just to remind you quickly how, how it looks. Um, So this is the co-associative axiom. And uh, it says that if we start with an element of C and we apply the coproduct and then the coproduct on the right, we get the same thing as if we take the coproduct and, and then we apply the coproduct on the left. It's co-associativity. And Co-unit property, um, which says these diagrams commute. Um, we're here. This is identity tensor with co-unit co-unit tensor with identity. And these are the, the canonical isomorphisms between this and this. And uh, Felipe observed that this is just very, very similar to, to algebra. And not only is it very similar, but there's probably some notion of duality. And so that's what I want to make precise. So what I'm interested in doing is, since we know that the definition of, a, of an algebra is basically the same thing, except that you reverse every arrow that you see here. Let's try to make that precise. Okay? So let us try to make the dual C star into an algebra. Okay? Using this structure. And uh, to do that, Actually, my notation, this notation is a little bit unfortunate because there's something called C star algebra in mathematics, which is totally different. But I'm just saying C star, I'm going to put the structure of a K algebra on it. Okay? So we're going to need to do a, a little review of some linear algebra. So maybe we're going to move to this board, and I'll just uh, review some things, and we will see what linear algebra we need to, to carry this out. Okay? Just uh, I, I said earlier, let me say it again that for the next few classes, the last couple of classes and the next few classes, I'm going to be following Sweetler's book, Moss Sweetler, Half Algebra. It's a really lovely book that is a little bit old-fashioned in that it's, it's old and it was typed a long time ago and LaTeX didn't exist at the time. But anyway, so let's do a review of linear algebra. Um, keep, this in your, keep this in your mind, but I'm, I'm going to erase it. So, so just a quick review of 
I mean, maybe maybe what I will do is just in parallel. We're going to see what what stuff we need to do here, and we'll and we'll develop the necessary linear algebra here. So, let us start with just the notion of a of a dual vector space. Okay, so you guys know what that is, but let's let's recall how that goes. So, duality of vector spaces. And I, I mentioned this last time that if if V is a K vector space, okay, then we have something called the dual space. And it is the homomorphisms as vector spaces of V to K. In other words, these are just the the linear functionals from B to K. Okay. Um, so one thing that I mentioned is that uh, these two things are actually isomorphic as vector spaces, but I wanna I wanna keep track of which is which. And this is something that maybe you've never done, and so I wanna do it with a little bit of care. Okay. Because one way that this is done sometimes is that you say, what happens if you actually have some bases here? Okay, so let's say, um, let's say that you have a basis for v, and it's given by some vectors vi, and I don't want to assume that this is a finite vector space, so I'm just going to take some indexing set here that might be empty. Okay, then you might be aware that there's something called the dual basis of this one. Or the dual space. And there's different notations for it. But one notation that I could use is V super I. Okay. Uh, so these are linear functions on V. So the way this is defined is that the ith linear function evaluated on the jth vector of my basis is 1 if the indices are the same and 0 otherwise. Okay. And this is one way of seeing that these vector spaces are isomorphic because, because you have a, the basis in bijection with each other so they have the same dimension. And two uh, vector spaces of the same dimension are isomorphic. Um, I should say that maybe uh, an even simpler way of saying this is well, you know, if, if your basis, you just think that the bases are the unit vectors 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, et cetera, then in the dual space, actually, the, these look exactly the same. If, if you call these, if you call these E1, E2, E3, etc., then these are going to be the functions X1, X2, X3, etc. And, uh, and if you draw, draw them as vectors, they're going to look exactly the same. And so I think it's very common when you first learn about this stuff to say, actually, they're just the same thing. You know, just identify this basis with this basis, and it's the same thing. And for some purposes, that's fine. But especially here, where, where you'll see that in this whole class, we're going to be having algebras and co-algebras, and we're going to be going back and forth from spaces to their duals. It's very important that we, that we keep track of which is which. Okay. So that's what I wanted to say about dual vector spaces. One thing that I mentioned that is very important is that this is a, this is a notion of duality in the sense that the dual of the dual is, is the itself. Okay. Um, okay. Any, any questions about duality of vector spaces? This is familiar, I think so, maybe but maybe not at this level. So we're going to try to do things abstractly whenever we can, OK? OK, so we're going to try to put, so let's, let's go back over here. We had our co-algebra. We're going to try to put an algebra structure on C star, OK? And so what that, what, that, what, is, what that is going to mean, and let's call this A, so that it sounds like an algebra. So what I want is to have a similar picture here, but with all the arrows reversed. I want this, I want this. 
and I want the arrows to point in the other direction, but, well, before you draw an arrow, you need to know what maps you're talking about, okay? So, the first thing to do here is to say, okay, uh, if I want an algebra, I, I need to dualize these two maps. And I would say that, that this one is easier than this one. So, but as you can imagine, the, the multiplication here is going to come from the co-multiplication, and the unit here is going to come from this one. Okay? So the unit should be some map from k to uh, a, which is c star. So how can I get this? Well, maybe one, th one thing that I want to claim, I want to claim two things. One, that k and k star are canonically isomorphic to each other. OK? That's one thing I'm going to claim. And the other thing I'm going to claim is that whenever you have a map of linear spaces, then you have a dual map of, of, those, of the duals of those linear spaces, and it points in the other direction. Is that familiar to you guys, or not, not to everybody, maybe? So let's let's make, let's let's say something about that. Okay. Um, so one thing is that we have a very simple canonical isomorphism from k star to k. Okay. Um, what is this isomorphism? What I'm going to do is. Now, one, one thing that I also want to mention about this is that whenever we, to, to make sure that we keep track of vectors and their duals, uh, vector spaces and their duals, whenever I have vector, a, a vector in B, I'm going to call it lowercase b. And whenever I have something in the dual space, I'm going to put a little star on it. And that way I'll know where, where things live. And I really recommend that you do this. It's very good practice to remember where things live. Okay? So given that, let me take an element here, k star, OK? So maybe I'll call it, I don't know, uh, v star, OK? So what is v star? v star is a function from k to k. And I want to map it to a scalar. So what scalar should I map it to? V, v, v evaluated in v star evaluated in 1. v star evaluated at 1. And what one are we talking about? Uh, V star, v star is a function from k to k, and so here we're talking about the one in k. Okay. And uh, that's clearly an isomorphism. What is the inverse? If you have a constant, what is the function that corresponds to it? If I have the constant lambda, what is the function that corresponds to it? It's multiplying by lambda. Okay. So this is an isomorphism. And so, let me go back over here. Actually, I wanted a map from k to a, but let me just remember that k is just, uh, it's canonically isomorphic to k star, and a is, by definition, c star. Okay? So I have this isomorphism, I have this definition, but now let's talk about that uh, inverse map. Okay? Not inverse, dual map. So the other thing is that if you have a function from uh, v to w linear, uh, then I get a dual function from the dual of this guy to the dual of this guy. Okay, so it, it takes duals and reverses the arrow. This is the dual uh, linear function. How do I define it? Well, um, let me take an element over here. And I call it W star to remember that it lives here. And I need to map it to something that I'm going to call F star W star. And how do I define this map? Well. I need to take, so S star W star is a function of V. So I need to decide, this is a function of V, so I need to decide what this should be. And what should this be? No, this star evaluated in 
There's not a lot of options. Yeah, no, no. So w star of f of b. This is the definition. Okay? Uh, and let's make sure this makes sense. v lives in my vector space b. f of b lives in w. And I can apply it this function which goes from w to the constants, okay? Everything here is linear, is linear and, uh, and so this is gonna be a linear map. Uh, sometimes we, li we like this notation that, you know, if uh, there's a pairing between b and b star where if we take an element of b and an element of v star, um, the the only natural thing to do is to evaluate this guy here. Okay? And this is a bilinear map. Again, it's bilinear because everything is, is linear on, on each coordinate. Okay? And so in that notation, I mean, we, we can write this as Um, like that, okay? And I write f v for f of v. But so this is this is notationally one one way of remembering this is that you can always take things with stars here and then put them on the other side without a star. That's how we can operate with these things. So that's how you that's how you reverse arrows from a from a map of linear spaces to the dual, okay? And so given that. I can begin to carry out what I want to do here, right? So, um, given that I have a epsilon from C to K, I can dualize that map and I get a map from K to C. So I'm just going to define U to be uh, basically epsilon star, okay? But maybe I will say this a little bit differently just to make sure that we cover all our steps here. Um, so I'll, I'll, you put u over here. So u needs to go from k to c. This is u. And the way that I defined it is that I said that k and k star are, sorry, this is a, right? Um, a, which is equal to c star. So I said this is like the canonical isomorphism from k to k star, and this map is the dual of epsilon. So I define u so that this diagram commutes. Okay, that's I'm, I'm saying the same thing a little bit differently. This is my definition of u. Make sure this diagram commutes. Let's see if we can define uh, delta. I mean m in the same way. So what does m need to do? M needs to go from C star, tensor C star, to C, right? This is what I need M to do. And I would like it to be the dual of this map, okay? And it is true that I, that I have a map from the dual of this to the dual of this. So I do have... Did I do this wrong again? Oh no, this is C star, right? So I do have a map from C tensor C star to C star, which is the dual of this one. And so if I manage to say that these are isomorphic, then I will have my map like this, okay? Now you see we're, we, this is a linear algebra problem that we need to settle. Are these two things isomorphic? And what do you think? Are they isomorphic? It turns out the answer is no, actually. Not necessarily, which is, which is surprising. So let's see why that is. Well, maybe the answer is almost yes. That's a better answer. So, I mean, you see, actually, if I want to define this map over here, 
I don't really need an isomorphism. I just need a map from here to here. And if I have a map from here to here, then I can go around and define n to be the composition of these two. So I am going to show that there's always a map, but I'm going to show that that map doesn't have to be a bijection. It doesn't have to be an isomorphism. Okay. So, We need this map, and uh, in my notes I called it row. Okay. So let's see if a lot of times these definitions you just have to stare stare at them, and, and the definition just is what it should be. So let's try to define row of somebody here. Okay. So I need to take a basis element here, and a basis element is a pure tensor. Let's call it little c star tensor little d star. Okay? And so that's going to go to uh, something. Row of c star tensor d star. Where I need to say what this is. How do I define it? Well, let's think about it. So this is supposed to be an element of this dual space. So it needs to be a function from C tensor C to constants. So let me just define what it, what it does to something here. Okay. I need to define what the value of this linear function is on each basis element, each generator here. So let's take a generator of C tensor C, which is something like this. C tensor D, where C and D are elements of C. And we need to define what this linear function is here. Okay. So what should I define it to be? What do you guys think? If I ask you to think of something natural to, to put here. Simpler. So the, the simplest thing I could do, the simplest thing I could do is well, I have a linear function, and I have something to plug in. Let's plug in. By the way, this might be equivalent to what you're suggesting, but um, I I can do this. But this is not good enough because d should d should come in. And so what should I do with d? Well, the simplest thing. I mean, I should also. I should also do d star d, and then what should I do with those two things? Multiply them. Why multiply them? Well, one, one thing is that this, this all needs to be bilinear. Right? These, are, these are all bilinear maps, and, and so this is linear in c, linear in d. This is a bilinear map. So this is the natural thing to do. This is a nice This is a homomorphism. Right? We agree. Everything. Everyone. I mean, let, let, me, let me say this a little bit more slowly. Because I'm defining this linear function on C tensor C. But remember, how do you do that? To define a linear function on a tensor, you need to define a bilinear function on C times C. And so what I did is that this is a bilinear function on C and D. And because that is bilinear, it really is a function of the tensor. Okay, so that there is that subtlety. But that is what makes this well defined. If I put a plus here, that wouldn't work anymore. Okay. So this is why this is the natural definition. So I, I always have this. Um, now, ideally, we would like this to be an isomorphism. Okay? And so we need to check, is it injective, is it surjective? So for example, is it injective? 
Well, let's see. Suppose that evaluated at something, I get 0. And we need to figure out whether this has to be 0. Okay? This is equal to c star c times d star d. Okay? And then, where do I get? Well, I get that either this is 0 or this is 0. And therefore, either c is 0 or d is 0. And therefore, c tends to d. Do you agree? And so this, this shows that, uh, that this function really is, inje is injective. Is it surjective? <laughs> I'm going to leave this formula right here. Wait, what did I do here? What I just did makes no sense. OK. So, um, so let's, let's make it make sense. So let's say that, sorry. OK. What I, what I need is to show, to show that rho is injective, I need to show that if this maps to, this, to the 0 map, then this guy is 0. OK. So suppose. Thank you, thank you for catching that. Suppose that is 0. Okay. Then that means that this is 0, and therefore um, this is always 0. For all. C and D in C. So how can I conclude? Well, I can say if if we evaluate in every element from the base, it's one one is zero or the other is zero. C C star is zero or D star is zero. Mm -hmm. Then the tensor product is zero, right? I I absolutely agree. Now let's try to do it without basis. Okay. That, that's a correct proof, I think. But let's try to do it without basis. Okay. Uh, I don't know. This is something that mathemat some mathematicians like to do, and it's good if, if we get practice with it. Um, so if C star is not 0, then find C such that uh, C star C is not 0. I can do that because if it's not the 0 map, then evaluate it somewhere, it must not be 0. If this is not 0, then this has to be 0 for all D. And therefore, D star has to be the 0 map. And so what I showed is that either C star is 0 or D star is 0. And therefore, C star tensor D star is 0. That's a proof, right? OK, so this is injective. And that's good. And that's actually all we need for, for what we're trying to do here. All, all you need is you need a map from here to here, which happens to be an injection. I know this, this little curliness here just means that it's an injection, okay? Uh, row. 
But once we have this, we have to wonder if this is an isomorphism. Okay? So is it an isomorphism? Can you give me an argument for why it is an isomorphism? I'm going to give you an argument why, why it is an isomorphism, but it's, a, but it's, it's not a, a completely correct argument, but it's somewhat correct. You see, the thing is, I, as I told you, I'm a combinatorialist. A lot of the things that I think about are, are finite dimensional. And if C is finite dimensional, then let's say that it has dimension n. So C star has dimension n. C star also has dimension n. The tensor has dimension n squared. This C sub tensor C has dimension n squared. The dual has dimension n squared. So if the dimension is finite, then if you have a map from one dimension to the same dimension and that map is injective, then that map is an isomorphism. Then this is an isomorphism. Okay? But what is a little bit surprising is that if the dimension is, is not finite, this doesn't have to be true. And so this is something, this is the, the exact kind of thing that I like to take to the forum. So I want you guys to uh, exercise, find an example with uh, C infinite dimensional. where this is not a nice one. Or maybe is it never an isomorphism if, if you're infinite? Or is, is it true? Is it always true? C infinite dimensional. So this is not an isomorphism. Think about it. This is a very good exercise to uh, to work with. Okay, but this but this is the point. If you're finite dimensional, this is an isomorphism. But if not, it isn't. Okay. But that's fine because no matter uh, whether it's finite or infinite dimensional, we have this injection that allows us to define this multiplication map, which is the composition of these two things. And so now we have a vector space with a, with a definition of multiplication and a definition of unit. And if everything goes well, that is going to be an algebra. And that's actually going to be one of the homework problems for homework two, is to check this. So uh, homework, but let's, let's state it as a theorem, but it's going to be a homework problem. Theorem, when I take A, with this multiplication and this unit, I get an algebra. In other words, the arrows here really do reverse the way that I expected. All right. So are there any questions about this, this duality? From a co-algebra, I build an algebra. I can always do this. Does that make sense? We're, we're happy? OK, well, similarly, I can try to do the dual thing. So similarly, if you have an algebra, with uh, multiplication and a unit, then just like here, we did this. Here we would like to do the the dual thing of defining a coalgebra with the appropriate delta and um, 
epsilon from C to K. And uh, hopefully you believe me that this mostly works, but maybe you see where the problem is now. The, the problem is that when we, when we try to carry this out, the arrow that we need is this one. And we don't have that arrow unless we're finite dimension. So it's very important that A is finite dimension. And if A is finite dimensional, then this arrow is reversible because it's an isomorphism and, and you can check that everything works. Okay. So again, the theorem. Well, it's not much of a theorem because we haven't really said what delta and, and epsilon are, but you can, you can work out what they need to be. And you get that C delta epsilon is a quadrant. Now, again, let me, let me propose a question to you that is a good question to, to think offline. What if you are infinite dimensional? What if your algebra is infinite dimensional but you, and you still want a co-algebra? Can you, can you do something? Um, question. What if, what if A is not finite dimensional? Can you still do something? So think about that and we'll send it to the, to the forum also. Um, okay, but that's, that's kind of a, a general, that's a very general construction from algebras to co-algebras co and, and vice versa in the finite dimension case. Um, okay, any, any questions so far? So, and I, I'm gonna try to keep true to my promise that every class should have some abstraction and some concreteness. So let's, let's uh, do an example of this with a concrete uh, Yeah, with a concrete co-algebra. Let's dualize a co-algebra and see what we get. What's your favorite co-algebra so far? Do you have one? The positive. The you're the only one that spoke up, so let's let's dualize the posit. Let's dualize the the posit coalgebra. So last time we defined a posit coalgebra. Let's see what we get when we dualize. Okay. Um, I am gonna need this formula, so let me just write it over here. our map from uh, C. Did I do something wrong? It's okay. Yes. Our map from C tensor, from C star tensor D star to C tensor D star. Okay, example. Uh, uh, it is, but it also works for C star tensor general, D star. But yeah. Example. yeah, but I, I'm going to write it like this just in case I need it when C and D are different, which is, okay. uh, is fine. I mean, the argument that we just made is is still true that. The, this function is always injective, and it's going to be surjective if C and D are finite dimensional, and if C and D are, if either of them is infinite dimensional, then we don't know yet. Okay. So 
uh, do an example of this. And let me, let me uh, say right away that this example that we're going to do is extremely important in enumerative combinatorics. And you might not recognize this right away, but if you've done some enumerative combinatorics, then I'm pretty sure that you have seen this in a different language. So let's consider, I didn't say it last time, but, but what I defined is the incidence co-algebra. P, okay? So remember that P is a poset. I draw it like this, this is the bottom, this is the top of the poset. Um, I consider, and let me, I, I didn't write this notation, but I think I like it better than the one I, I wrote last time. So let me, let me write int P for the set of intervals of P. all the subposets between some x and some y. Um, and so remember that the elements of C of P are the linear combinations of, of intervals. So as a set, this is just linear combinations of, I mean, as a vector space, these are just the linear combinations of the intervals in P. And uh, let's remember that the co-product here, so it needs to go from one interval to a bunch of tensors. And we saw that with the co-product, we define the co-product to be all the ways of doing this right here. Okay, so the sum over all the z's between x and y of x, z, tensor, z, y. And we define the co-unit to be one on the trivial intervals from x to itself and zero otherwise. Okay. This is the incidence co-algebra. And so now let's try to figure out what the, what the dual of this thing is. It's going, to be, it's going to be an algebra. And we're going to call it the incidence algebra. Because we're going from co-algebra to algebra, we don't need any finiteness conditions. This works in, in general. OK, so what are the elements here? The elements are just going to be the, the linear functions. So um, elements, they're just going to be linear functions from linear functionals from here to our field. Right? So uh, C star from C to K. Let me write uh, C for C of P and A for A of P. Okay? They're linear functionals. Now, if I want to define a linear functional, I might as well just define it on the, on the basis elements, right? And so I'm, I can identify this with a function from intervals to uh, okay, so this is the same thing as functions, which I'm also going to call C star, from intervals to K. Okay. So an element of the incidence algebra is just a function that assigns a number to every interval of the poset. Now let's figure out what the multiplication is. So 
the multiplication in A. So I need something like this. And this is C star, tensor C star, and this is C star. Okay. So in other words, what I what I need is to I need to tell you, given an element here, a, uh, a pure tensor, what is the multiplication? But we have no choice in the matter. This is, this is all given by the, by the recipes here. Okay? So what is it going to be? Well, let's compute. So C star D star is an element of C star. In other words, it's a function from intervals to k. And so I need to tell you. We need to figure out what it does to an interval. Okay? And by definition, uh, C star D star is this, okay? And I evaluate here, but again, let me use this notation of taking the doing it like this. Okay? Now, what is M? M is the composition of uh, rho and delta. I, actually, this, this was supposed to be delta star. Delta goes from C to here, and this is supposed to be delta star. Okay. And so M is going to be delta star rho. So this is delta star rho of C star tensor B star comma x, y. OK? Now, what do we do? Well, remember that whenever we have a star here, we can send it to the other side okay? and take the star away. So um, I'm going to put, well, let me do two things at a time. No, let me do one thing at a time. That's better. This comma delta of x, y. Okay. Now, what is delta of x, y? Well, that's, that's the co-product of uh, the co-algebra here. We have no choice on the matter. This is sum this x z tensor z y right and now what is this well again this this is uh, this is bilinear so we can take the summation out so i take the summation out And now, what is rho of C star tensor D star? Well, maybe. What is rho of C star tensor D star here? Well, what it is is supply C star to this guy and D star to this guy. This is, this is what the formula says. So we apply C star to this guy. We apply D star to this guy, and we multiply. OK? And that's it. That's, that's what the multiplication is. Do you know this multiplication? Does it remind you of something? 
uh, sorry, uh, this is x, z, z, y. X, z, z, y. Okay. So what are we doing? Remember, we, we need to associate um, to each interval, we need to associate a number. So C star and D star do that already. And the way you do it for C star, D star is that you take your interval and you look at all the ways of, go of splitting it into, into two pieces like this and you apply C, to, C star to the bottom and D star to the top. And this is, this is what's called the convolution product. This is, this is convolution. Convolution. That's what the multiplication in A looks like. It's, it's convolution. How many of you have seen Mobius functions? Nobody? You raise your hand? I've seen it. <laughs> okay, so some of you have. Um, maybe this reminds you a little bit of Mobius functions and it will more when, I, when you see the homework. Because you'll see that, that uh, the theory of Mobius functions comes out very, very naturally from this point of view. And uh, you might know Mobius functions from combinatorics, or maybe you learn Mobius functions in number theory. And, uh, and it, it, we're talking about the same thing. So this is one very natural way to arrive at the, at the concept of a Mobius function in number theory as well. Okay, so we have elements are these. Multiplication is convolution. But we still need to figure out what the unit is. So let's figure out the unit. The unit is given by this diagram, so I won't erase it. So what is the unit? Um, well, the unit is a map from k to c star, and it's linear. So all I have to figure out is what u of 1 is, and then I'll know what the unit is. Okay. So let's figure out what u of 1 is. And this is yeah, u of 1. Um, u of 1 lives in C star. Okay. And so if I want to know what it is, I just need to say, you know, again, it's a function from intervals to numbers. And so I should, I should plug in an interval. Let's see what I get. So let's do this. So what is u of 1? u of 1, well, u is epsilon star of, I didn't give a name to this thing, so maybe I'll call it phi. Epsilon star phi of 1 paired with x comma y. Okay. As, as usual, let's take the epsilon and send it to the other side. And what is phi of 1? Phi of 1, well, th this is the natural isomorphism from uh, the field k to the functions on k. So what is the image of 1? The linear function that multiplies by 1. In other words, it's just the identity function. And uh, let's call it 1 star. 1 star is going to be the identity in k star. Well, this is just the identity, and so actually this is just equal to, to this number, epsilon of x, y. Okay. And epsilon of x, y is 1 if x is equal to y, and 0 if x is less than y. Okay. And so, so that's what the, 
unit is here. Okay. It's the function that assigns one to trivial intervals <coughs> and zero to, to the others. One to trivial intervals and zero to the others. Okay. Um, and I really mean this. I, I think I'm not lying when I, when I say that um, Giancarlo Rota was, I, I think he was the first person to to develop this, combinator this kind of algebraic combinatorial theory of, of incidence co-algebras and algebras, and, and this was after the theory of Mobius functions, which he also invented at the level of posits. And I think it was this construction that led him to realize how important half algebras could be in, the, in, in a number of combinatorics. And we will really see that, that this co-algebra and this algebra are really great places to you know, play in the algebra and co-algebra and find lots of really nice combinatorial identities. Okay. So that's, that's a concrete example of, uh, of a dualization from an incidence co-algebra to an incidence algebra. And in principle, you can always do this. Given, given these things, you can find these things. Um, if somebody else had answered and, and had chosen a a simpler co-algebra, then this would have been faster. You can always do this. Um, and again, you, you can expect that in the homework, I'm going to ask you to dualize something. So this will be a good template to, to figure out how to do that. Okay. Um, okay. So are there any questions about this example? Maybe one thing that I should ask you um, where have you heard convolution before? The word convolution. Measure theory? Anywhere else? Lots of places. Can you think of a convolution in combinatorics? You might... You might Something called the convolution formula for binomial coefficients, which says that m plus n choose k is equal to summation of m choose a, m choose i, and choose k minus i. I want you to look at this and think there's a copper copper hiding there. Does that sound reasonable? This, this looks a lot like you want to say that delta of something is equal to something tensor or something. A lot of formulas that look like this are really just particular instances of, of copper formulas. And you might want to start thinking about how you would prove this simple. I mean, of course, this formula is easy to prove. But it's nice if you can give a conceptual explanation from this point of view. And maybe you can, you can start thinking how you could do that. And there's a lot of formulas that look like this. And, and so you can see how they fit into this framework. OK. So that's, that's it for the example that I wanted to discuss. We also finished duality between co-algebras and algebras for now. And the next thing that I want to show you, it's a very strange notation for working with co-algebras. I mean, at, at least it's strange when you first see it. But then hopefully after a while of using it, you will be convinced that it's a, it's a useful notation. The thing is that um, if you're used to if you're used to products, then 
I mean, I know you're used to products and, the, and therefore algebras are, are pretty easy things to you guys, I think. You know, maybe they're a little bit more abstract, but you're just multiplying things and you've been multiplying things since you were a little kid, right? But you have not been co-multiplying things since you were a little kid. And so, you know, in, when you were in elementary school and in high school, you had to learn how to, how to you know, expand, you know, something times something and multiply and, you, and you're very used to doing those kinds of operations but you are not used to doing operations with co-multiplications. And when you start doing it, you realize that our traditional language is very kind of centric towards multiplication and addition, and naturally so, because that's uh, kind of historically more important. But we're gonna discuss a language, a notation that is useful for co-operation, for co-multiplication. And so this is what's called it's funny because in the book he calls, it, he calls it an important notation, but since then this became Swedler notation. And Swedler, of course, is the author of that book. So Swedler, Swedler notation or coalgebras. Um, in a coalgebra, C, uh, we have our co-product that goes from C to C tensor C. And let's say that you actually want to write a formula down. Okay, so for example, what if you want to say what is delta of little c? How would you write that? Well, it would be just some generic element in here. And what does a generic element look like in here? It's gonna be uh, a linear combination of these things. So it's gonna be some finite sum of maybe lambda i times c one i tensor c two i. So it's just some linear combination of things like this. That's already getting a little bit ugly. Um, what are some ways that we can simplify this? Well, one thing we can do actually is that remember we're working with a tensor product and so we can absorb this constant lambda i. We can just put this into this term and call that c i1. So in other words, you, you don't really put, need to put lambda i's here because you can just put them, multiply them by here. And so this is, a, this is a fine formula also. That's a, that's a correct general ray of writing an element in here, okay? Um, but I don't know about you guys, but I don't really like double subscripts. I don't think anybody likes double subscripts. And, and so the, not, this, the Swedler notation for this is just to forget those sub, double subscripts and write and also forget this and write this. Okay, that's Swedler's notation for a co for a coproduct. And so this right here, what you put here is what you're taking the coproduct of. Uh, what you're taking the coproduct. And then these things are they're kind of variable elements in C. Okay. But of course you realize right away that C, C sub 1 doesn't represent a particular element because this is a sum of different things and we all, we're always used to calling them C1. Okay. So it's kind of a lazy notation really, but it's, what, it's, uh, it's what's customary. What is this like? This is like writing a normal summation as what? 
saying, look, sum of a. Right? That's, that's kind of what you're doing. And maybe you do, maybe you have done that in life, actually. Sometimes you just get tired of writing something in the subscripts, and maybe you would never turn it into an official homework or an official paper, but maybe informally you have written something like this, and you kind of know in your head what you mean. Okay? And so that's what the notation is. Um, I should say that some people take, the, take it to, a, to the next level, and sometimes, sometimes people will actually write this. And uh, somehow you're supposed to know that if, if you have something like this, then you're supposed to remember that there's a, there's a summation. And so <laughs> this would be like taking this and writing it like this, A, right? <laughs> um, so it, that's why it's, it's a little bit cumbersome and it takes a little bit of time to get used to it because it's a very simplistic notation. But it really saves you a lot of time and energy and ink and uh, paper and everything, okay? But you have to be careful using this notation. So that is Swedler notation. Now let's say a little bit more about it. What happens when you take the, the thing is you see when you when you multiply a lot of things, I mean you know how to multiply two expressions, and actually we know how to multiply three expressions, four expressions, etc. And so we also want to be able to take coproducts of coproducts of coproducts. And in fact, that's exactly what we do in the, in the very definition of coalgebras. We, we have a coproduct of a coproduct. Okay. And so what, how do we uh, do that? Well, so we have this, li this little picture here. And let's see what Swidler notation has to say about this. Okay. So we know that if you start with an element here, whether you go this way or this way, you're going to get the same thing. And we're going to give that a name. We're going to call it, let me make sure that I get this right, um, the second coproduct of C, I don't know, how would you write this? If you want to invent Swidler notation, extend Swidler notation. Think of the simplest thing you could write. Let's not take it to this extreme. I'm, I'm going to try not to do this. Although I have to say that this, when you start working with this, you, you do this. When I first saw it, I thought this is ridiculous. But then as soon as I started computing, I, I, I did this myself. But I'm going to try not to do it on the board in front of you guys anyway. Um, so what should this be? Well, it's a summation, right? And it should be a summation of, of triple tensors because it lives in C tensor, C tensor, C. And so the simplest way of writing this is like this. Okay. Um, So what is this? This stands for going either this way or this way. Right? Remember this is delta and delta composed with the identity. Sorry, the tensor of the identity. And this is delta and this is identity tensor delta. And so this, this is what you get uh, when you do either delta tensor identity of delta of C and also if you go the other way. Al already you see this is, it's so easy to make mistakes here. And it's just much easier to write this. And in general, If you, if you do this n times, 
sorry, if you do it n minus 1 times, then you're just going to get a sum of n tensors. And you just write this. OK? OK. Now, um, let's say a little bit more about this. Let's, let's do more things with this notation, rather. So if you have a multilinear multi function, this is multilinear. Now, what do I mean by multilinear? I mean that, I mean, here I have a, a, a product of n things. And what I mean by multilinear is that if you fix any n minus 1 of them, then the resulting function is linear on the, on the other. It's multilinear. And as you can imagine, we have a universality theorem for n tensors that says that if you have a multilinear function, then we get a function f bar. from the nth tensor product to V. And we're going to write we're going to write the result of applying this to this. So I take an element in my coalgebra C. I apply the coproduct n minus 1 times, and so I get a bunch of n tensors, tensors of length n, and I apply f to those. Okay. So this would be the same thing as applying f twiddle to this thing. And we're just going to write this as summation over c of f of c1, etc. c. Okay. We're going to use that notation. So let's let's uh, let's practice with this a little bit. I think I shouldn't have erased what I just erased, but that's okay. So example. I'm gonna I'm gonna write something in Swedler notation and then we will see what it's supposed to mean. Say that I write this. Okay, so this is this is supposed to be Swedler notation for something. So Swedler notation for what? Uh, this is like this is like deciphering a new, a new language. Um, well, we apply this notation when you have a function of a tensor. And what we have here is not a function of a tensor. And so to make it a function of a tensor, what we do is that we rewrite this as delta tensor identity of C1 tensor. Delta of C1, tensor, identity of C2, we get this thing. Okay. Um, okay, so now what is this? Well, these things are linear, so I can pull this out. I get this, and this is delta of C. Okay. And so I said that I shouldn't have erased this because this is what I had just written, right? This is what you do when you take C, you apply delta, and then you apply delta across the identity, delta tensor the identity. 
So this is the Swedler notation for what happens when you do that. Aquí. So it, maybe it would be more natural to put the, the tilde here. By the way, have, I don't know if you guys have noticed. I, I think maybe I said this in English. They call this tilde, but even though we don't call it tilde. But whenever I say tilde, I mean this. Okay. Um, for for some reason, sweet learn notation, you don't put the tilde there. Just just because. I mean, actually, this is pretty common in in, in mathematics that when 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 you have a function that descends to a function on the quotient, sometimes you get lazy and just write the write them with the same letter. So that's what we're doing. It's not too dramatic. Um, OK, so this is what happens when I take an element of C and I push it up, up and to the left of the commutative diagram. And so now I can write the co-associative law in Swedler notation. So what is the co-associative law? Well, it says that if I do this, I should get the same thing as what? Well, you can, if I give you a little bit of time, you can, you can see what, well, what you get if you go the other way around, then you can probably guess. So what you're going to get is the same thing, but the delta goes to the other side. That is the co-associative law. Think of this as this, right? I mean, when we talk about associative things, we write it like this, and then we went through the trouble of encoding it into that diagram. And that diagram was equivalent to this formula, and our and our our mathematical notation is perfect for associative things. Our mathematical notation is not so perfect for co-associative things, and so this is the best available formula version of co-associativity. And so these are the kinds of things that, we're, that we need to play with if we, if we actually want to perform computations of this form. Okay? Um, what is the co-unitary property? or co-unitary law. Well, again, I mean, let's see what this says. is C goes to C tensor C, and then around, and then back. And that's supposed to commute. And when you go to, and this is uh, delta, this is identity, no, this is C goes to K by the co-unit, and this is the natural isomorphism. Okay. And so again, you can write this in Swedler notation. You can see what you get. I have an arrow backwards, don't I? This is supposed to commute, and it's going around. <laughs> I guess I do it like this. Um, if you write this in, in Swedler notation, and I really encourage you to do it. You really have to get used to the notation. You should also expect in the homework, I'm just going to give you, it's going to be like a algebra homework of eighth grade. Prove this identity. I'm going to make you prove that A times B plus C times D is equal to ABD plus ACD. I'm going to make you prove identities like this, but with, in the core world, and so of course it's going to be harder. And uh, for example, if you write the co-unitary property, if you see what this says, uh, you'll see, I did it. You'll see that what you get is this. No, sorry. Like this is equal to C 
is equal to this. Why do I have two equal signs? Well, because the co-unitary property goes around this way, but also around this way. So you're going to get two equations. So what is this equivalent to? What is the uh, non-co version of this, the traditional version of this? In other words, what is the unitary property? What is the formula for that? Do you remember? But I, I mean, I mean, if if we go to just like algebras, and if we go to forget tensors and just look at you know the first time that we saw an algebra, and we said something called the unitary property. Remember what that was? It's very simple actually. It just says one times a equals a equals a times one. So this is the traditional version, and this is the dual version. And so the, here you can see how this is going to be a challenge to, <laughs> to prove something of, of this complexity. But you know you get used to it, and then uh, that's what I'm going to make you practice with this. Uh, you pro you probably probably a lot of you have had to teach calculus, and I've had to tell your students you need to practice with derivatives and integrals. And I I could not be more serious. If you don't practice this, you're never going to learn it. This is not a spectator thing. You really have to do it yourself. And so. Do this one. I'm, I put another one in the notes that you should do. And then homework, I'm going to give you like like eighth grade homework. Do this, do this, do this. Uh, <laughs> and you, you'll practice your co-algebra. Okay. Um, okay. I think that's a good place to stop. Unless you guys have any questions. <laughs>